we are going to have a conversation with Anne Mazera. Uh, she is a journalist, but uh, right now she is on leave from La Stampa, and she's working uh, at, uh, please, La Camera dei Deputati, which is, uh, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say with you, uh, which is the, uh, one of the two chambers of the Italian Parliament, and uh, managing communication with them. And uh, in a way, reshaping the way, the, the, the way we approach uh, the conversation, our conversation with uh, this uh, uh, very important institution. So the format we are having today is we, we have about 30 minutes is, uh, well, everybody can ask questions. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a journalist, I cannot do interviews, I'm not very good at interviewing people, but I am sure that uh, uh, all of you have very interesting questions for Anna. And uh, as you know, we have microphones in the room, so uh, I hope we have microphones in the room. Where are you, microphones? Here, can the microphone come running? And, um, okay, so let's begin. First question. Okay. Okay. Be Benjamino has a first question. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, Maybe you should introduce yourself. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm Benjamino. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a journalist. Um, my first very simple question is, and please be sincere as much as you can. Uh, eh? No, no, no. <laughs> che cattivo. No, my, my simple question was... Don't embarrass me. No, no, okay. no, sure. But what you found on your first day? Um, because the, the general perception about uh, political institution is very... Uh, they don't not, they don't do nothing and uh, they are just consuming our tax dollars or euro and well sometimes and m maybe many times there are people working but uh, they are working in in a strange strange and not very useful way so please don't okay i understood the question so first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me here, and uh, uh, it's great to uh, to talk, even if it's it's always strange for me because it's very recent this change of jobs. I, I mean, I was a journalist until January, and then all of a sudden I'm on the other side, being a press officer and uh, uh, head of communications of a big important institution like like uh, the uh, the house of commons of uh, italy so it it for me it was a huge change but also a real challenge and uh, the first day i arrived i arrived with some boxes uh, full of my stuff and uh, it was really cold and uh, it was the 6th of january and it was a holiday and everything was closed up and so i asked permission to bring my stuff upstairs in my new office. And there was a bit of bureaucracy at the entrance, but they were all very nice, incredibly helpful, and uh, I was actually really impressed. I was honored to go inside the, the temple of democracy. I realized it's not a popular place, and I found out really quickly that I wasn't going to be very popular either as soon as I decided to accept this job. So I... I knew I was going to have to fight. It's a different position of what I'm used to. Usually I'm the one making questions and writing nasty articles about other things you know, that are not working very well. And all of a sudden here I was supposedly defending a place that was attacked by everybody because it's known for being a place where people waste, I mean politicians waste money and the administration, the bureaucracy wastes money. All the talk in Italy is about cost cutting and spending review. So those are the only real subjects that we have to deal with in terms of communications is spending review. How much are, re are you cutting costs and why aren't you cutting costs enough? So uh, I was, the real challenge for me was to try to s move the topic over to other things that are also more interesting than just costs, but also content. I mean, 
what are we supposed to communicate? What, what's happening at the chamber, at the House of uh, Commons and in, in Italy? And, but not merely what's happening in terms of what are politicians debating and quarreling about, because there's enough press about that, and I don't think I need to communicate that very much. I just need, you know, my, 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 that's the traditional part of the press officer of, is, is to help uh, the press come inside and see what's happening and write about it. And that, that, that's already being done. I mean, the press office I found is very good at doing that. So I didn't change that. But the challenge was that I was given, uh, I was given the opportunity to actually bring digital culture and to bring digital communication and social media in there. So actually, I was, I was to try to make social people outside, citizens, to bring them closer to what we're doing. I was actually bringing communications outside to where the social media are, so going on Twitter and YouTube and going out there with my own profile, but with a new profile that I, that's the first thing I did is I opened a new profile uh, from scratch called Montecitorio, at Montecitorio, that's the Twitter handle, and, uh, and uh, I wrote a social media policy for that. In order to do that, I first, I had to, you know, gather the, uh, the, the consent from everybody else, I mean, inside the House of Commons, which means talking to the politicians and talking to the administration, which is huge. I mean, there's hundreds of people there that I have to deal with and talk to and make sure that they all agree to what I propose. I can't just do whatever I want. I mean, I was, I have a mandate for two years. I'm on a leave of absence from my newspaper, La Stampa, but uh, I can't do whatever I want for these two years. Every time I want to do something, I mean, the, it's the good and bad part of the bureaucracy. I have to get the consent from everybody. I mean, they have to vote about it. I mean, I have to propose it, and then they vote, they decide, and then I do it. But the strength in this is that once I, they vote, and they vote favorably, then I have a mandate, and I can do things, and nobody can say anything against it. So the very good thing was that I, I wrote a, an editorial plan. That's the first thing I did. And I, I went in front of this communications committee which I found, I mean, I ironically used to call it mean cool pop, because it makes you feel like, oh my God, you have to go there and there's all, they are there with machine guns, you know, as, as soon as if you propose something that's not good, they're gonna fire at you. But actually, it was pretty good. I mean, the, the, the reason they chose me and they didn't choose a political, uh, you know, journalist, a reporter who was more experienced in politics is because they really wanted someone who had been in a long, for a long time an expert in social media because I was a social media editor for two years, you know, at actually almost three years at La Stampa and I was, you know, a web editor for almost 20 years before that. So I, I had a lot of experience with digital communications and so they trusted me for that. And so I, the credit, the reputation I gathered online through the years and on social media before that really was credit that I could actually cash, cash in for my editorial plan. They accepted it in a way, I mean, I, I didn't expect to have that much trust. I thought they would be more suspicious of my proposals, but actually they, I guess they kind of, uh, they bet that I could make it, I could bring some fresh ideas in and they said, okay, let's see what you can do. And so they gave me some credit for that. And, and so f in these past, I've only been there five and a half months and, uh, I've done many things in these months. I'm sorry I'm taking up all this time for only one question, but I'm, basically I want to wrap up what I've been doing and then we can go on from other questions. So what I've been doing is after the editorial plan, the first thing I did is I asked for a small group of people that are young people that I was able to hire as collaborators. They're, they have a contract as, uh, in the, for six months to open up social media because I needed a social media team. I wanted a, a graphic designer for uh, visualization, graphic visualization, because we needed to do some graphs and some, some uh, to show the data in a, in, a, in a more pleasant way, because the problem of bureaucratic websites of institutions like, like uh, you know, like this, I mean, but anyways, in general, public administrations in general is that the, the websites are awful to look at. They are very deep and full of information, really interesting, but they're very difficult to navigate for regular citizens. So the, to make it simpler, the, my, my, my objective is to simplify communication and make it more direct. I mean, transparent in the sense of comprehensible, accessible to everybody, not just 
to the expert of politics or the legislator. And uh, so I, I, I was able to get a graphic designer with a, with a short contract and to get a, a, a video maker who makes videos for YouTube, telling stories of what's happening inside, outside, bringing outside what's happening inside the, the palazzo. <laughs> which is seen as something, you know, evil, but actually there's many things that are actually really good happening in there. There's both, you know, good and bad, but I mean, I, I'd write, I like people to see what's happening and then they can make their judgment and able to be able to express it on our turf, which means on the social media that we open up because there's a conversation out there uh, about the House of Commons and uh, of Italy, and uh, there's, uh, we weren't there listening to it. So now finally we're there. So we're, we're picking up the conversation and we're picking up what, they, what people really want to know, and we try to answer that. And we answer that by making, we answer that by making, creating hashtags on Twitter and linking the laws they were looking for that couldn't find, linking the, you know, the, the video streamings of what was happening inside, uh, creating hashtags with wiki hashtags showing you know showing stuff that was in the website that's very interesting in terms of not just the laws but all the uh, the documents that are really interesting and, and the videos and the, and, and, the, and the library there's an incredible library with lots of incredibly interesting material historic material too so historic anniversaries of Italy trying to bring back the identity of Italian democracy and in, in talk about that too, because values I think are important. We shouldn't just be talking about cutting costs, but also about values that we should show that everybody kind of shares. So share those values with citizens who believe in them, because I don't believe that citizens don't believe in democracy anymore. There's a lot of mistrust and a lot of frustration, but in the end, if you, if you publish something that people recognize themselves in, it's very liked. I mean, I noticed that the most shared and most liked tweet that we made was on, of the June 2nd. And uh, we shared that with the, with the referendum, uh, uh, the ballot. The ballot, yeah, the ballot sheet of the referendum where Italy had to choose between monarchy and republic. And we picked up an old photo and uh, and of, of that of those of that time and and we published it and we showed it and that was you know the the birth of the republic and uh, and people really recognized themselves in that and it was so shared it was like it had 700 retweets and it was wonderful and that made me f understand that if we share interesting things and things that people like i mean we're doing the right thing and we're going in the right direction okay i have Thank a question you. Uh, first a remark and then a question. Sorry. My name is not Beniamino. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Luciano. Anyway, no, next. Hi, Luca. But, hi. No, um, the remark is about the term, the frame casta. Um, I'm sure that uh, uh, Many Italians here know about this frame that was set by a book that described the political system in Italy as a caste, uh, a place in which there is a special kind of people that does whatever they want and they live in their own world against us citizens. And that kind of frame was very well uh, earned by our political uh, situation. But then it became something more. It became a sort of uh, cage in which everything that was done in the political system became cast. And my remark is that it is now the time to throw away the caste frame. In Italian is yeah. butta la casta. Uh, that means <laughs> Because um, uh, if we don't throw away the caste frame, uh, we are unable to understand the effort and the good things that can be done by new people coming into institutions that want to do real good job for citizens, which Anna is an example of. 
uh, not only because of her English that makes uh, you an envy, uh, uh, envious of uh, his pronunciation, but also uh, uh, about the fact that you, in six months, have done a lot of things. So my question is, how is going to stay, to last, the improvement, the innovation that you're bringing into the chamber or House of Representative or whatever you say in American. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, how is it going to last for the long time? And, well, <laughs> how, are you going, how are you going to measure the success? Because, yeah, 100 retweets is okay, but. Well, it's a, it's a really good question because I'm already being asked that. I mean, I'm, I'm about to face another one of those Minkul Pop meetings where, where the Committee of Communications is going to ask me for the results of what we've been doing so far. I mean, so in these, in these months we've, done, we've had a bar camp we have it on, on the digital agenda, on the scoreboard of the European scoreboard. We've done a hackathon on the open data of the House of Commons and uh, 200 hackers came inside the House of Commons and actually programmed and wrote code for us and, and developed apps and uh, we're about to uh, assign them prizes and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm very proud that the president of the House of Commons agreed and actually was enthusiastic about the, the hackathon and the bar camp as formats for, of communications within the House of Commons, so that, that means that we're bringing civil society inside, you know, that casta place where they will bring fresh ideas from outside, inside, and convince politicians to do something about their ideas and actually to write legislations regarding their ideas. On Monday, we're doing a, we're going to have a huge convention with people coming from all over Europe and even from Brazil, the Marco Civil uh, people who wrote the Bill of Rights called uh, Marco Civil in Brazil are coming and uh, we invited the, the Court of Justice lawyers who wrote the, the, um, the, who, who wrote the sentence against Google for, for the, I mean against Google is not, is not a nice thing to say, but I mean against, for the uh, right to, forget, to be forgotten, which, which is the diritto all'oblio, right, the right for, to be forgotten and, uh, and also the, the uh, if against the retention, the data retention uh, directive, and uh, we are inviting uh, pri privacy authorities from uh, all over Europe, and, uh, and ob obviously the Italian uh, privacy authority, Mr. Soro, is coming, and uh, the Minister of Justice is coming. C considering that you know there's a European semester coming up, this is going to be a huge topic: the idea of a Bill of Rights for Europe to bring uh, the attention to the Internet Bill of Rights, to the idea, the idea of a constitution for the Internet has always been very controversial, but it's always been kind of a, a fixation for Professor Rodota, and he's the one who proposed it first in Europe, and actually the first country who adopted it is Brazil, ironically enough, and not Europe and not Italy. So now we're bringing back the subject to the House of Commons, hoping that they will pick up the idea because one of the most important rights to uh, guarantee in Europe is the right, the access to the internet and uh, net neutrality. And I think these rights really have never been uh, given that much attention as now. And it's about time that someone legislates about that in terms of fixing those rights and making them into a law. And so these are, I'm really proud that these are things that we're, we've been doing while I'm there. I'm not sure when I'm, I, when, I, when or if, whatever, when, when my mandate is over, if this will go on, but I think so, because I think once we've started this, I don't think we can go back. I mean, I don't think the House of Commons can do without Twitter now that they're, they're there. And I don't think that they can do without YouTube where we are, you know, and, and the web TV and the video streaming of what's happening inside there once, once we've done it. Because now the politicians want it everywhere, even too much. I mean, they want videos everywhere, even when they're not necessary. And, um, and we're doing, and all these debates, I mean, everybody's been asking for more and more debates within, and that, like, there's not enough room to hold them all at, at once. And so we're actually trying to find places to hold them because sometimes they're at the same time. There's like three debates 
going on, on big, huge events, and everybody wants them in video streaming, and they, everybody wants Wi-Fi, and everybody wants the hashtag, and everybody wants live tweeting about them. And so it's becoming huge. I mean, I think once you use social media and digital communications, everybody gets used to it really quickly, and you can't go back. So said that, I mean, I think if tomorrow I left, I, just, I changed my mind and I left tomorrow, I don't think they are the ready, they would have to choose someone else again to come and, 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 and substitute me. And, I, and I, in a way, I feel like my mission isn't over yet. I mean, I just arrived and six months is not enough. So I'm glad they gave me two years and hopefully I, there will be a good transition so that now that we've started something, there's going to be, um, there's going to be someone who picks up. <laughs> Thank you. Antonella. Hello, my name is Antonella. Um, my question is, well, actually, I have sort of two questions. So in, at La Stampa, as social media editor, you were innovating the process. And uh, probably like outside the outside community, the, the digital community in Italy uh, perceived you as an innovator. And uh, of course, that's your role as well uh, at the Chamber of Deputies. But since for, what, what Luca said about the, the, the casta in Italy, uh, has the perception changed from the digital community? Uh, are you still perceived? Uh, as an innovator or since you're inside, there, there are like a, a different kind of, uh, of comments. Uh, and uh, especially thinking about the digital community and all the conversation we've been having for years about um, innovation, about digital rights, the, the, the ones you mentioned, um, have you uh, experienced uh, some kind of uh, debate saying that we should move faster, you're not doing enough, you're there and you should do more and more and more. And uh, like my, my other question related to that is that um, you were innovating before in a newspaper, you're innovating now in institutions. Uh, uh, is there resistance to change uh, of the same kind? There are different kinds of resistance to change the culture like, in, in, from, like inside, from coming in some way from the outside and, and try to change how institutions or organization works? Okay, well, I don't have that much power. I mean, I, I think the institution itself wants to change and that's why the institution chose me. So I don't think it's me really changing the institution. Let's face it, I mean, they are the ones who are changing within and that's how I, I derived. I mean, I was chosen because of the change that's happening inside. So. I arrived at the right time, at the, I mean, in the right place, let's put it that way. I, I don't think I'm the one who's changing it. But I am, let's, I'm, I'm the facilitator. So, I mean, I understand, I understand the idea, that they, what they ask me, and I, and I, I, I totally agree, I agree and adhere to the idea, and then that's what I'm trying to, to realize. However, um, I think, uh, okay, first, let's go back to your first part of the question. Of course, there's a lot of negative remarks. I mean, I feel like sometimes I'm on a battlefield. And to tell you the truth, my worst enemies are my, uh, are journalists. Are my, I mean, it's really weird to say that, but my colleagues, the, polit the political colleagues, not all of them, are, of course, they're all, you know, they are, there's a whole spectrum of all journalists, of newspapers, and my, and I, I, I I was, I was very criticized by some, very few, luckily, because most of them are in solidarity and they actually know me and I have, a, I have a good relationship with most of them. But some criticized, I think it was more, you know, because of political driven criticism that I, you know, I'm, I'm fixated with digital. So, I mean, I'm being ridiculed because I, I have this fixation with digital communication. And so I realized that maybe what I have to do is I have to uh, make myself more uh, available to all, to all media, not just digital media, because I'm a bit too focused on digital because I feel like there's so much need there. But I should remember that media is everywhere, not just digital. So it's also paper, it's also television, it's also all other media. I love radio. But I mean, and, and I don't have time myself personally to do that. So I have to focus more on sharing with my other, you know, with my press office. I have sort of, I haven't paid attention enough to the traditional part of, of, of communication because it's working by, it's, it's, it's going on. It works so well that I, I haven't really done anything in that aspect. So there comes the criticism from, to me. And I, uh, and I, uh, I mean, I accept that criticism because I mean, I can't, I realize that I, you know, 
that's something I have to improve. And um, other than that, I'm, I mean, the criticism comes really not, it's not for, against me or against my way of communicating, it, it's, a, it's a political thing, you know. I mean, the president of the House of Commons has been criticized because she spends too much on, communi on digital and social media communication because she's, you know, she was the one who's being blamed for having chosen me. Because of course she's the president, so she presides the whole House of Commons. So she's the one who gets all the criticism for the expenditures. Like the, the, the criticism that she gets from the opposition is she spends too much on communication and it's taxpayers' money. And so recently there were articles saying, you know, they were dividing the amount of money being spent for communications in the whole House of Commons by tweets and saying each tweet costs so much money. Uh, which is obvious, obviously a, an absurdity, I mean, it was a paradox, but that's the way, you know, it's being perceived. I mean, it's always coming down to spending review and cutting costs. Of course, communication cut, costs money, but I mean, I, they're trying to keep the costs really low. They've cut a lot of costs. I'm going to reduce costs because I have a plan of, you know, renovating so that a lot of for example, costs of uh, printing the press release, printing press releases or printing press reviews. In the old days, everything was printed. Now we are cutting that, we're making it all digital. So those costs will be cut. So eventually, I will be able to, you know, to, to show that we have cut costs, that we have increased communications there where there was no communication, with very little increase in expenditure in terms of because social media is not expensive, you know, it's not expensive to open up Twitter. So we have a social media team, but it's, you know, it's, it's a small team. I mean, yesterday we had a huge convention at the House of Commons with, um, with uh, all the European social media teams from the other European parliaments. The European Parliament has 30 social media editors. I mean, I have two. So I felt, I mean, of course they translate in many languages, but I mean, I felt, okay, then I, we're okay, we're not doing too much. Maybe, maybe the other ones were spending too much. Maybe the, maybe the, the you know, the cost cutting will happen there before it happens where, where I'm starting. I mean, so that's, that's normal. I mean, that's, I accept the criticism, but I keep going because I think this is the direction we have to go anyways. Ayana, are you going to convince uh, President Laura Boldrini that free speech online is not evil? Hate speech? It's not uh, evil. It's not uh, a bad thing. That hate freedom, speech is not uh, evil? Not hate speech, of course, is, is a bad thing, but uh, the freedom of speech online yeah. is not so ter a terrible, such a terrible thing. I think there was a misinterpretation in what she said. I mean, I think through the, you've seen through in the past year how she's actually... Uh, um, she's been going more in depth in that direction in terms of explaining her thought. I think when she comes across as wanting to uh, stop um, s cyber, uh, sometimes the English words don't come to me, cyberbullism, cyber cyber you say that? Yeah, so hate speech anyways. Uh, she, she's definitely come across very strongly against hate speech, but she's really for um, for, you know, freedom of expression and for uh, digital expression and people being able to use the internet and having, otherwise she would not sponsor all these things that we have been doing so far. I mean, the fact, she, does, she's very, she feels very strongly about a constitution for the internet, about a bit of rights, she feels strongly about rights because she comes from a world where, you know, she was the spokeswoman for UNHCR, which is a United Nations uh, agency for rights, for, for human rights, and so she's, she's very sensitive about human rights issues. But she's very sensitive about also women and women's rights and about uh, equal opportunities and about women being, uh, being bullied online and so she, when, when things like that happen, sometimes politicians in general tend to, tend to feel that it's the medium's fault and that's that's not just her, and I think she's changed her opinion through the months, and she's actually uh, adjusted it pretty well. So, I mean, I'm not her spokeswoman, so it's not that I can't speak for her, but I, I, I talk to, I have strong exchanges with her, and uh, we're coming along well, and I think she's actually, we're understanding that, I think her, 
lately her, her opinions have been pretty good about all this. Okay. Um, here, one thing I like, uh, I like about Trieste is the role of women here. I understood, thank you for, for Paolo, who, who really explained me the role of, uh, of uh, Teresa d'Austria and the women of Trieste, and, and, and really the story of women as, an, as actors for peace in, in the history of Trieste. So I wonder, you said that you were at the right time there, but don't you think that the fact that you're a woman, after all, is the changing factor? Because you're keen to understand, keen to open, uh, like Lysistrata, you know, in the Greek tragedy, are the women who enter and say, stop fighting. Now it's the time for, to comprehend and build something new. Do you think that this is probably a winning factor in this precise moment. Yes, you have an ex expertise, blah, blah. But the, the cherry on the cake is the fact that being a woman, you are more open to understand the, the other, instead of a macho approach to things. Well, I have to say, I thank you because there's so many friends here and so many supporters and you're, I mean, Gigi, I've known you forever and you say some th nice things. I mean, I could never say think that, but I think it's really nice of you to say that. And uh, I think it's not just me as a woman. I think, the, I mean, the president is a woman and I think a lot of women are politicians now that didn't used to be there. I mean, the House of uh, Commons now has has almost 50, I mean, there's more than 40% women. I mean, almost 50%, it's almost equal. The, and, and it's a new thing in Italian politics. And hopefully that, that helps. I'm, uh, uh, I think being a woman makes it, uh, it gives me a competitive advantage in the sense that when I have to put up a fight with a smile, I get more, <laughs> more lis people exactly. listening to me than fighting. But I have to tell you, I mean, actually, I'm a very, expo I'm, I mean, I'm uh, very exposed in terms of media compared to my predecessor. I don't think anybody knows who my predecessor was because the role before was not so exposed. I mean, before it was a very gray role. It was just, you know, it was a bureaucratic role inside a bureaucratic environment where you only had to facilitate other media coming inside. Now the media, we are the media. We disintermediated the media so that we are actually competing with the journalists who are writing about the Chamber of, the House of Commons. I keep saying Chamber, but I mean, it's um, the Chamber of Deputies or the House of Commons, whatever. So basically, I have a feeling that I'm competing with my colleagues uh, on giving the news on Twitter, for example. Like, we write on Twitter, on the Twitter account of the House of Commons, things that they're writing in the press agency at the same time. And uh, so things have changed so fast. That's the real challenge, is, is uh, we are the media of ourselves. I mean, we are, I'm writing about, you know, I'm writing about what, I mean, what I like other media to write about, but I mean, if, even if they don't do it, I go directly to the citizens and give them the communications. Ciao, Luca. So, um, so that's, that's uh, the real new thing, is that we don't, it, it's the crisis of the media that I've been writing about before going to, you know, in, into this new job. When I was at La Stampa, I was saying newspapers are in a crisis and the traditional media are in a crisis because everybody can actually communicate directly themselves to whoever is their client or their, their, uh, their uh, 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 constituency or, or their public. And in my case, the citizens. I mean, I, instead of hoping for a newspaper to write an article on how wonderful we are, I just write it directly on Twitter or we stream it on YouTube and eventually we're going to open up on Facebook. And, uh, and all this is going to be you know, already out there before even newspapers or, or the traditional media will write about them. So it, it, we are on a parallel line and, and we're going out. And I think that's really my strength, is that I've arrived in a moment where all this communication has changed. Yes, but you use a term that is embrace, understand. Rather than talking to the media, you said there are so many beautiful things to talk about. Yes. So you're, yes. you know, so, like, like a mother that, that <laughs> tries to understand what's yeah. going on, you know? And yeah. uh, I think that this is something that people understand. 
and, and this makes a change, I think. Yeah, I think that what's happened is that basically what we do is when we organize, for example, big events, is that all the media that's interested in that comes there around, around uh, the influencers of the internet, the bloggers, the, the citizens who are, who are experts on that subject, and it's not, there's no separation anymore. So what I do is just facilitate that communication between the politicians on one side, the, you know, the, the administration in the House of Commons on the other side, and, and, uh, and all this, all the media together. And, uh, and, the, and these events, eventually, who wants to collaborate is that I'm there just to listen and, see, and try to, to make them collaborate better. I mean, I was criticized for the bar camp that we did for, by a couple of, a few people, because, you know, I accepted the help of whoever wanted to help to make it a success. And I told them, okay, next bar camp, you can, you know, suggest a subject, you don't want to do it on the digital agenda, send in, and we, we put on, on a civic media website, uh, we put on, you know, uh, we, we put out a, a page where everybody could send proposals and propose. You propose the next bar camp and, you know, we'll, we'll accept your proposals and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do them. I mean, we're ready to do whatever, you know, the majority wants to do and we'll listen to everybody. So that's what we're there for. Okay, we have time for one last question, and you one here was is coming. I was giving. Sorry. Oh, okay, you. Mine's very quick. Um, I really, as Professor Lucy Huberman, I'm Professor of Digital Media and Innovation from the UK. I really like the um, idealization of the capacities of women to achieve these changes, and often it's true. But don't you think it's also the reason why you're being so criticized and your president? We often find that because you're a woman, you're going to get more criticism from your colleagues. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want me to do a, take a stance in, in that it's, term, no pro I have no problem with that. I mean, it's difficult. It's more difficult, so we have to be better. <laughs> and we are, mostly. <laughs> so. Okay, so thank you very much, Anna. I think it was a very interesting conversation. We are going to have the coffee break now, and uh, it's going to take, we have half an hour, so make sure you get back for the last uh, session and uh, enjoy your coffee. Thank you.